want you to go briefly into the history. Um, just we're just stepping back to 2012. So this is the pie chart for how we are at the moment, looking at renewables, nuclear, gas, coal, and other. That's the sort of percentages in 2012. As you can see, coal is 39%. We got quite a fair amount of coal that we were generating electricity from. When you step forward to now, I can only go to 2021, they haven't got the figures out for all 22, but you can see in terms of gas, we haven't changed, we haven't changed all that much. We've got 28, we've actually increased our production of electricity by gas by another 10%. So instead of running lower on gas, we're actually running higher. Uh, the take up has been taken up with wind and solar at 24.9 and the other renewables. Coal has shrunk right back to 2.1% as you'd expect. Nuclear is 14.9, which is fairly stable all the way through. Um, and hydro, we've got just 1.8. So we've still got a fair amount of gas, and that's why we've got so much in the way of problems, because of the gas situation. I must admit, I thought we'd be running much less on the old gas as we went along. So the reason for our problems, Mr Putin, obviously, is shut off that gas valve. He's going to make sure that Europe doesn't receive as much gas, if any, so they're going to have to look for other supplies. So there's a, there's a problem. Obviously, Europe straight away is looking for more supply. Our gas storage is low. It was low because of a couple of things. We had a long winter, the coldest April since 1922, which I think we've probably forgotten about, really, as, as we've gone on. We've had a tough year for the sources of power, um, EDF, their atomic reactors, there's 14 of them that were off. They were offline. They'd had problems. So, of course, that's a major difficulty when you've got an atomic reactor that's offline. You've got a lot of work to get that back online again. There was also a fire in Kent of the cable from France because we're taking energy from other countries undersea cable. And if we've got a, a fire in one section, it actually makes it much worse for us because we can't send out or, or receive on that cable. It was a, I mean, it's a fairly substantial cable, so you can imagine. Also, just to compound the problems we've got, China, Japan and South Korea have bought huge quantities of um, uh, natural gas, liquefied natural gas, which is frozen down to a terrific degree to be able to be transported around the world on tankers. So these are big players, China, Japan, South Korea, they really are big players. And the sixth problem, the reason why we've got a problem, is there's a lack of long-term planning. I didn't want to get political, but that's our biggest problem, really. If you haven't got money that actually can see further ahead, if you look at the Chinese pattern, or if you look at some of the larger um, people in the world, as it were, countries in the world, their planning is much more long-term than ours. They know what they're getting into. They know what they need to be doing. And they put provision to get there. We need low-cost energy, not <coughs> electric. Currently, the lowest form of energy is wind generation. It's even lower cost than PV. You, uh, apparently, I didn't realise this until I looked into the um, information, it takes 14,000 PV units to equal one wind generation turbine. That seems like a lot to me. But the PV units that you have in the, in, in the farm, the PV farm, Sorry, solar, okay. yeah, photovoltaic, okay. yeah. Yeah. So you've, the way to go, is wind generation onshore and offshore. Onshore, the average generation is 2.5 to 3 megawatts, but offshore, we can generate 3.6. The reason is each blade on the offshore ones, they're 220 meters long. 
Can you imagine that? 220 meters, it's a fair old whack. And that gives you much better uh, efficiency than if you're at a smaller blade type. One of the reasons why we haven't got the sort of um, sizes of wind turbine is political. <laughs> um, Mr. Cameron, bless his heart, he stopped the companies from building any bigger than that in this country and said, no, we're going to stick to a regulation that's um, a specific size. And so we are now bound by those type of rules. They've got to have a lot of changes to get that different again. So there's no tip height regulations for offshore, so they can build them as big as you like. So they can, I mean, the Norwegians have got lots of big ones now, and we're going to follow suit as we go along. So the future, as far as generation is concerned, is a blank sheet of paper, really, with regard to what we need to do next. The things that are coming is going to be something like a wind, um, a wind farm that's on sea, but they will have anchors on the seabed, and they'll be floating. This means that they can go into much deeper water. So it means that we're currently we're only on a, a very small shelf of uh, sea, as it were. These can go right into the North Sea, into deeper areas. And it means that they can generate much more and much quicker, if you like, than what we've ever been used to. The difficulty is with offshore stuff, it's maintained. If you've got to maintain a, an onshore uh, system, Obviously, it's easy to get at, you can do the maintenance easier. With this sort of thing, you've got to have quite a lot of maintenance structure, if you like. So they reckon that to get to our goal of um, 2050, to have a carbon-free, if you like, and a renewable type of operation, we're going to need... that sort of number of jobs. It's going to generate 600,000 type of jobs in that industry to get us where we want to be. So there's going to be a lot of opportunity for job creation as you go along. But it means if we don't go this route and we just drag our feet, we're going to be using this bloody gas for a long time. And we're going to be stymied by people like the Russians who are going to be continuously shutting down that gas. The only way out for us is to go renewable and probably renewable offshore. Are there any questions?